my name is Katie. I'm the CEO of AMSA. And I would like to acknowledge that the AMSA office is on the unceded ancestral and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. And I'm coming to you from my home in Surrey. And I am on the unceded ancestral and occupied territories of the Kwantlen First Nation. I would like to point out uh, and thank the Immigration Refugees and Citizenship Canada for funding this event. Um, IRCC has been a, a longtime funder of AMSA and is very committed to this work and to, um, to working with us to bring this information to you. And so we would like to thank IRCC for their support today. So our time together today, our time together today is um, going to be about two hours. We will finish by four. I will make that commitment to you. I am doing the welcome introduction now and Norm will um, continue with the smudge and a prayer and guided meditation to get us started and set our intention for the day. We will then move into talking about Indigenous people and find out what have you heard. We'll talk about some history and statistics. We'll talk about spiritual connection to land and about relationship, not ownership. And we'll talk about timeline of colonization and intergenerational trauma and end with a closing meditation. We will have a break in there somewhere. We'll kind of gauge and see how everybody's doing, how everybody's feeling, how Norm's doing. And when we need to have a little power down and have a break, we'll stop for you know, 10 minutes or so and then we'll, we'll gear back up. So the Zoom etiquette, I think most of us are pretty familiar with Zoom etiquette now. So we will ask you to stay on unmute or on mute when you are not speaking. When you're speaking, don't forget to unmute yourself. For the most part, we're going to we're going to listen, we're going to reflect, um, but there will be opportunities for you to ask questions. And so, if uh, if you have a question, we'd ask that you either raise your hand. We won't necessarily come to you right away because Norm's going to continue through the through the the dialogue. But that way, I know that you do wish to speak. But really, the best way is to is to just put a little note in the chat, and that's another great option. But I do encourage you not to spend a lot of time writing great big long questions in the chat because then that's taking away from your listening and, and a, a lot of um, a lot of what we're going to do today is about listening so you, you know please indicate to me if you do have a question or a comment. Um, but just a little note in the chat is probably the best way. And if you have any technical difficulties today. Uh, please contact Nagin. So you can either just put a note in the chat, but if you're having technical difficulties, then chances are you can't access the chat. So uh, sending a, a quick email to Nagin at N-J-A-V-A-H-E-R at AMSA.org. And if you just want to take a second to jot that email address down, and that way you are guaranteed to have some technical support shall you need it. And so I now get the, for the privilege of introducing Norm. So Norm Leach has been the executive director for the Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Centre since May 2016 and is a trained facilitator with the Canadian Human Rights Foundation, which is now XTAS, and with the Shat Liam. Did I do that right, Norm? Close. Close? Shat. I've, I've been practicing. Restorative justice in Lillooet. Uh, so Norm was the facilitation specialist with the National Centre for First Nations Governance and worked with communities across Canada to develop Indigenous governance models and constitutions. For the VACPC, Norm facilitates the cultural sessions for Police Academy and Sheriff's Academy at the Justice Institute, and has been teaching Indigenous tools for living across Canada and online. ITFL is based upon Indigenous-focused oriented therapy. And so, Norm, I am going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you, my friend. Okay, wow, thank you. Biggest Zoom meeting I've ever been in. Thank you all. Um, so, Kaswa Alap Mishnaknukwa, Norman Leach, and Squatchy Chat, Leetkat Muskan, Stadt Lemskan, Amati Achkan Trumus Anna. It's uh, wonderful to see you all. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you for attending and, and listening to. Um, being willing to learn more about Indigenous history and culture. As you can see the smoke in front of me, I, I lit the smudge uh, just a little while ago. So I'm burning sage here in order to clear the space here and to make sure that I, I'm prepared to move forward and say things in a good way and to 
share in a good way. I'm just going to set that aside here for the minute. Um, I know that Katie did a land acknowledgement just a few minutes ago. I do them a little bit differently. I did notice that um, most land acknowledgements end up acknowledging the people on the land uh, <laughs> instead of the land itself. And I, I like to acknowledge the land because the land was there long before we were people, long before the dinosaurs even, um, and land has always been there and it's it's the root of everything. It's really the land is our oldest ancestor. I call her our great, our first and our great, great, greatest grandmother is the land uh, because she has given us everything. Um, every cell, every molecule, every atom of our, of our bodies is from the land and will return to the land. And all our ancestors have returned to the land and so the land is the root and the start of, of everything as far as we know. So I acknowledge her first. And then I acknowledge the people who've taken care of her uh, in a good way for the last 15,000 years, at least here. Uh, and for here where I'm in Vancouver is the Musqueam and the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh people. <clears throat> so I acknowledge them. And then I smudged. Uh, I cleansed my hands and my, my eyes and my ears and my mouth and my heart and my, th my, my head uh, with, the, with the smoke. Uh, start me off in a good way. And, 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 and feel free to share or to do your own uh, wherever you are uh, to um, do a virtual smudge, uh, which more and more of us are doing these days. Uh, and in the bio that Katie shared, uh, she mentioned uh, probably the most recent shift in my work is Indigenous Tools for Living, and that's based on Indigenous Focusing Oriented therap Therapy, which was developed by uh, my, one of my cherished mentors who I see on the screen in front of me, Shirley Turcott. <laughs> Hi, Shirley. Thanks for attending. And it, that's been a, a major shift for the work that we do in the downtown east side, uh, as far as helping the people who are, who have and continue to survive uh, far more uh, harms and traumas than, than most of us could even imagine. And, and they're doing it and they're carrying on. And we learn so much from them when we work with them. It's, it's amazing the depth of spirit and survivor spirit that they that they carry. Uh, they're very inspirational and and wonderful to work with if you can get down into the to the human beings that are underneath the trauma. <clears throat> um, so we like to start with a guided meditation. And uh, so for this one Try and start with something simple. I would I'd ask you to, to get comfortable where you are. And notice your body. <clears throat> notice how you are in there. See if you can quiet your thoughts a little bit. Notice your feet. Notice your hands. Now, if today you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? Where would you be? It's the time of day, time of year. What do you hear, see? What's happening? Is there anyone else there? Animals, trees? No 
Notice your roots. Reaching, holding the earth. Feel that connection to the ground. Notice your trunk. your foliage. Feel the energy of all that's around you. Feel the connections that you have with everything around you, the land, the animals, the other trees. Okay. Okay, so now you can prepare to come back to your body. Say good. You can leave all that in a good way. It's still there. Feel prepare to come back. Remember those feelings. Bring that sense of connection. And that sense of groundedness back with you into the room, into your body. I'll know you're back. I see your eyes open, perhaps a smile. Okay. Welcome back. So I want to start with that during this discussion because we will be discussing some difficult things. And I want you to be aware of your place where you are and, and your connection to, to the land and to other things around you. Because when we talk about indigenous people, it, it includes trauma. And sometimes that trauma may be triggering when we talk about the trauma of our history, it may bring back memories, ancestral memories of traumas in your family lines as well. So you need to be aware that you are here and I wanna make sure that you stay here wherever you are. So I wanna start you in a good way and I wanna make sure I end you in a good way today too, this session. So hopefully that was good for you. Um, trees are amazing. They know so much, they've been there so long. They know some of them know our ancestors and we have such a connection to trees. They're healing, they are spirits, they're medicine. So I'll share a little bit about me. So as you heard, I'm the executive director here at the Community Policing Center. And we work downtown east side Vancouver. And for those of you who have been there and seen it, even on TV, you know it's, it's a difficult place to be. And you probably also know that there's far too many indigenous people down there. So our work is to work with them. And that means we end up working on many issues, including we work with the families of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. We work with overdose prevention we work with homelessness, we work with drug addiction, substance use, work with violence, um, death, um, youth, women, families, uh, loss of children, children in care. Um, all these terrible, terrible social issues that indigenous people face in the city and so our target group is the Indigenous people living in Vancouver. And there's about 70,000 Indigenous people living in Vancouver. Most people don't know that, that there's that many. 
Um, as you can see behind me, there's a picture of mountains behind me. That's where I'm from. That's my, that's the view from our reserve in Lillooet. That's uh, the mountains across the river that we wake up and see every morning. And uh, boy, when I'm there, uh, I, and, I, and I bring people there and I tell them and I show them and we, we stand in the mountains and I just wave my arm around and say, this is why we never built churches. We never had to build churches. We basically live in the biggest sacred place in the world. The world is our church. But I didn't grow up there. I was born in Vancouver, in East Vancouver. I grew up in East Vancouver. <clears throat> um, and part of that is because of my mom who went to residential school. Uh, she went to residential school in Mission. And then after that and the, the abuse she suffered there, she tried to go home, but many of the same abuses that she had suffered in residential school were, were now learned by the people at home. And so it was just as dangerous and violent and toxic at home on the reserve as it was in residential school. So she ran away from there as well and went to Vancouver and and that's where I was born. Um, but for a young indigenous woman in the city uh, with substandard education, uh, the work she could find was very limited. So my, my mom actually was a sex worker and that's, uh, where, where I came from. Um, so that's, you know, a bit of our family history. And then somewhere in there, after I was born, mom got married. Um, someone fell in love with her and convinced her to marry him. Um, but because he was non-native, that means the laws at that time meant that is the minute they were married, she lost her status. That means she wasn't an Indian anymore. And and any benefits or privileges or, or rights that she had as a native person uh, disappeared um, because that's that was the law back then for native women. Um, and, and actually the reverse was true. If a native man married a non-native woman, that non-native woman instantly became native. She became an Indian under the law. Uh, that, was, uh, that was the Indian Act. But that was a, a very colonial policy uh, in order to, well, separate uh, women and children from their culture and community, and then introduce uh, colonized culture into reserved life too. So, and, and again, so, and as I'll talk about later, there were many, many laws that were designed to do those types of things, and they were very effective. It's, it's, uh, quite brilliant, the tools of colonization that have been developed over the, over the millennia. Humanity is very, uh, I guess, yeah, in, in, ingenious in, in approaches to colonize other people and other lands. So I grew up in East Van. Um, as a native person, uh, not looking entirely native. I, I looked, uh, I, because I am, I'm, I'm half Chinese because apparently my father was uh, of Chinese ancestry. Uh, I've never met him. Uh, I can't identify. There's no way of, of uh, finding out who he might be. But uh, so I actually have probably more Chinese ancestry than indigenous ancestry. Uh, so I, I looked uh, very Asian when I was going to school, which actually turned out to be quite a benefit to me because uh, Native kids in, in public schools get identified and streamed into remedial classes almost immediately. Uh, and they very often get labeled as behavioral problems. And... 
but I didn't look native, I looked Chinese. So the actual opposite assumption was made about me that I was smart. <laughs> uh, and as it turns out, I probably was. Uh, but I got sort of streamed in with the other Chinese kids and, and assumed that I could learn math quite well and uh, speak quite well and write and, and do all those things. Uh, it did happen to me later on as, as I dressed and behaved more native that uh, those stereotypes got applied to me. Um, but unfortunately, growing up in East Van and growing up in an alcoholic, violent household uh, to uh, dysfunctional parents, um, and I was the oldest of the, of the children that were there. I actually have two older children who were taken at birth, or two older siblings who were taken at birth, because uh, mom was underage when she had them, and the nuns basically just came and took them away when they were soon as they were born. But I was the first one that she was able to keep. Um, so, so largely it being the oldest, I had to take care of the younger kids. And then because my uh, parents were alcoholics and uh, dysfunctional, I kind of had to parent them as well. Uh, but then they, you know, I did also learn a lot of other bad stuff. So I was a pretty accomplished alcoholic by the time I was 15. Um, so I'm... Yeah, so I did what I was taught, uh, what was normal for us, right? So what we learned growing up was that if it's a, if it's a wedding, you drink. Well, it's a, if it's a funeral, you drink. If it's a birthday, you drink. If it's a hockey night in Canada, you drink. If it's, if it's Friday, you drink. Uh, so that's what we learned. Um, every occasion to possibly drink, you drink. Uh, so yeah, I'm, um, I got, uh, I drank a lot, um, but I'm in recovery now. It's been like 25 years since I had a drink. Or, and unfortunately the, the drinking also leads to drugs. So I'm also a recovering addict too. So I, I did my addiction research downtown, uh, Vancouver, Skid Road, back alleys, uh, um, and I have to say that it's, it's a lot worse now than I remember. It's so much worse. Uh, we didn't have fentanyl, you know. We didn't have the homelessness. And it's, it's so much like, and even now, like. But in any case, um, like many others, survived that survived all those things and in order to to sober up and, and that was about 25 years ago for me <clears throat> um and again certain miracles i think uh, made it possible for me to survive all the things that i survived and then also be able to sober up and, and go back to school and, and find work and gain custody of my children and then to, to move home and to learn culture and to reconnect with the land and, and the, the teachings of, of my ancestors and to learn language uh, and, and to fish in the Fraser River and catch salmon um, and to learn that way of life and to, you know, to go in the sweat lodge and to learn the spirituality. And then eventually I also ended up becoming chief. So I served as chief of my community for five years. Um, and then I stayed and uh, managed the band office for another three more years after that. And so learned so much in that time. Um, I think largely what I learned is that during those years that I drank and did drugs, I wasn't growing in those years. And that was about 15 years from about 15 to 30 is when I drank. And probably in that time, hardly grew. So when I stopped, I was really a 15 year old trying to learn how to become an adult sober. Um, but, but, you know, with, with help and, and patience, uh, I survived that too, <laughs> still learning. Um, 
And then uh, as uh, the, the bio says, I went on and did a bunch of other things, worked across Canada and, and throughout the province and, and actually worked with technology quite a lot. Uh, I went back to school and got a diploma in computer systems technology. I'm, I'm actually trained as a database programmer. Uh, although I don't do much of that. Now I'm basically a, a manager and executive director. I manage programs and office. So that's me roughly. And, and probably for, so for the last few years, I've been managing the, the community policing center in Vancouver. And really this is the first time that I really worked in the city of Vancouver. Uh, largely I worked at home, uh, worked on provincial issues as a chief and Thailand rights issues or in community or with a national organization or a provincial organization. So this was a learning experience for me as well to understand the downtown east side. Now, I touched on it earlier. What we find is that of all the issues that people face downtown, the indigenous people, whether it's homelessness or poverty or substance use or uh, violence, more and more we can trace almost well over 90% and maybe even 100% is rooted in trauma. And it's rooted in the trauma of colonization. And for indigenous people in this country, colonization is equated with genocide. And it's a tough word. Uh, it took a long time for people to get a little bit comfortable with that word. But finally it came out in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and it's far more acceptable to, to use that word now. Uh, it used to basically shut down the conversation when, when that word came up. But now people are willing to listen, especially when we talk about uh, its relationship to colonization. So you are here to understand and learn uh, from a newcomer's perspective or a settler perspective or, or some of you even from an Indigenous perspective about the history and the relationship uh, with Indigenous people and maybe to learn about some of the current events and how relevant they are. Uh, you might be seeing on the news the events in Nova Scotia, uh, up north on the Wet'suwet'en, the pipeline, even here in uh, Burnaby in Vancouver, the, the pipeline that is uh, intended to the Trans Mountain that's intended to end up here in the Burrard Inlet. So I'll give you some more context on, on uh, how that comes to be and the perspective of Indigenous people when we, when we talk about these things. So I, I see uh, quite a diversity of uh, faces in front of me here and many colors. And as usual in these kinds of discussions, mostly women, imagine that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's um, some might think it's sad, but I think it's also awesome uh, because women are the ones who actually get things done. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I see that now, especially on the, let's say protests uh, and, and the people leading the charge to protect water, to protect land and to protect the, the future of our children and grandchildren. It's the women who lead those, the women who have no choice but to, to do what's right for their children and their families and their communities. And it's, uh, I'm still trying to figure out what happened to men along the way. <laughs> We're working on that, but we'll get there. So as far as indigenous people, I suspect that for those of you who weren't born here, you heard things about us and maybe you've seen things about us on the news and maybe you've read things about us in the newspaper. And a lot of those things are stereotypes. Um, some of them are valid. Uh, you know, I, I grew up a stereotype. I'm an alcoholic and an addict. Um, you know, I, I did drop out of high school. Um, I am a child of a broken home. Um, 
but there's other stereotypes that that are just applied um, without considering the reality. Um, many that we hear often are that you know we get free free houses. Uh, no, we don't get free houses. <laughs> Uh, people think also say that we get free university education. No, we don't get free university education. Uh, people say we don't pay taxes. I pay taxes. Uh, all the indigenous people I know in the city, we all pay taxes. Except when I go to Park Royal Mall, the, 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 the north side of Park Royal Mall. That's because that's on reserve. So if I work on reserve or I buy something on reserve, I don't pay taxes. If I have a valid status card that says, it's got my picture on it and it's got my signature on it and, and it hasn't expired, then I get exempt from essentially, what is it, 12% tax, uh, sales tax. Now, if I was working on reserve, like when I was, of managing the band office at home, then I didn't pay income tax. That was awesome. That was, <laughs> because that's like 30%, right? Except that everybody knows that you don't pay taxes. So they end up paying you less in the first place. <laughs> so as a band manager, you know, I was, you know, managing, like I would, I would manage a $5 million annual budget. I was paid $40,000 a year, right? Because I didn't pay taxes, right? So normally that job would probably pay well over $100,000. But uh, so, so the benefit, and I also like to tell people that when, when that benefit was written in, into the law, and we didn't write that law, right? The Canadian government wrote that law. When they wrote that law, nobody paid taxes. Right, there were no taxes in Canada until after the Second World War, right? Or maybe the First World War. They only instituted taxes to pay for the war. So when they gave the benefit, it was worthless because nobody paid taxes anyways in those days. <clears throat> so there's many stereotypes about Indigenous people, right? And and many of them are reinforced by pictures or even going walking down the street downtown Maine and Hastings. Um, but the, as the, over the course of this, you'll understand why those people are there more. And, and then you'll also understand how, why we do the work that we do in order to uh, alleviate that, that situation. I'll also talk about the stereotypical views of Canada. For those of you, again, who weren't born here, Canada has a pretty solid reputation around the world, right? Canada's seen as, wow, free, right? Democratic, uh, rights of human rights, a bastion of human rights, um, rich, um, rule of law, um, clean water, clean air, lots of space, trees, wildlife, all those things. And largely it's true. Um, but once you've lived here a few years, you, you also know that it's not true all the time and it's not applied equally to everybody, right? So there is large wealth disparity in Canada. So that exists. And, and Indigenous people are unfortunately at the, the lower end of the, the economic spectrum. Um, and again, that's due to, as I'll talk more about, it's really due to colonization. And it's not an accident. So I ask a question of people. Do you feel that, do you identify yourself as Indigenous? And Maybe if you do, I don't know if you click the little button, the reaction button and put up your hand and say, yeah, I think I'm Indigenous. But most people don't, right? People have an idea of who's Indigenous. And it's usually, you know, that person, that brown person over there, they're Indigenous, you know, dressed in their traditional clothes. And uh, 
But I also say that in my work here at the community policing center, we're the Aboriginal community policing center. And some people come in the front door and they say, well, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm indigenous. So can I still get some services here? Can I, can you help me? And I say, well, I, I don't check ID and I can't do blood tests. So if you think you might be indigenous, then that's good enough for me. And really everybody is indigenous to somewhere, right? Your ancestors came up out of a land somewhere, you know, somewhere in the past, your ancestors are rooted in land somewhere. And you have an ancestral line that probably spent several thousand years in one place. And that's where your indigenous roots are. Ours just happened to be here. And we just happen to be some of the most recently colonized people here. And in some places, colonizers came in and colonized the, the place and stayed for quite a long time and imposed themselves on the people. And then for one reason or another, whether peacefully or not, they left, you know, like say India or maybe some parts of Africa or other parts of Asia. Uh, but here they never left. They're still here. <laughs> and, and they don't like to talk about any other alternatives. <laughs> uh, despite the hashtag of land back. But so if that's something that I can ask you to reconsider is, is your own indigeneity. Think about where your indigeneity would be and what that would be like and where and, 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 and what it means. And if that's true, then also that means probably in your past family history, there's colonization, right? If your lands were colonized by others or even if your ancestors were colonizers, that's a family history too. Um, and that's something that we understand as, as being a source of well, knowledge and awareness, also of trauma. And that's a source of trauma often because often colonization led to war, um, starvation, uh, even pandemic. Right? Even in all our family histories, there's history of pandemic. It's, it's global human history, right? But if that's all able to be passed down through generations, intergenerational trauma, then so is wisdom, so is strength, so is healing. Uh, and that's probably the root of uh, the indigenous focusing oriented therapy is knowing that if trauma can be passed down, then so can all those other things. And those people who survived it before us have so much wisdom about and healing and power about how to survive it for us too. And if we can access that, then Well, then it goes to, to prove some, some of the other things that we've learned in our work here at the Community Policing Center. That if we can survive it, we can heal it. And so that's, you know, that's the work that we do here and, and with many other agencies in the city of Vancouver and across the country and around the world. And so each of us is healing from our family histories and the traumas that our family lines have survived. And so I'm here to basically talk to you about how those are very similar and form the basis of, of, of uh, connections and maybe even alliances uh, that we can use to you know, help ourselves and each other, but also perhaps to deepen the discussion to you know, a, a better model of, of living as human beings on this planet uh, together rather than in conflict. 
So I'll talk about some of the statistics. So indigenous people in this country are somewhere between three and 4% of the population in Canada, right? So for, so Canada, I guess there's about a, must be getting close to a million indigenous people in Canada now, um, maybe a bit more. So Canada roughly has a population of about 35 million. And so we're about three to 4% of that. Uh, and it's growing. Um, Now, as far as land is concerned, reserve lands in Canada, well, as colonization progressed east or from east to west, right? So the first explorers landed in the east coast and then moved west bit by bit, slowly. Um, in the beginning, it was all recognized as Indian land and treaties were signed so that uh, explorers and settlers could come in and settle lands and and they had a policy of uh, signing treaties before they came in and the king basically set that pro uh, policy uh, there's a royal proclamation of 1763 now that was the british <clears throat> now there's some thought that says well that says that we were lucky to be colonized by the british uh, because in relative terms, the British were less, took a, 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 a less violent approach to colonization than others. Um, some colonizing countries were a little bit infamous for being much more brutal. Uh, Spanish, uh, Dutch, uh, Russian. Um, probably others, but it's, it's, I think it's said that if you had a choice of who to be colonized by, you'd probably choose the French first. French kind of sent in men who would eventually learn the language and probably marry in, uh, learn the traditions. Um, sort of that's where Métis people ended <laughs> up coming from. Um, and then after that would be the British who tended to, you know, at least set, set up some rules and laws and then tended to follow them for the most part. So we were colonized by the British. Uh, but they quickly learned that the power of setting up your own laws is, well, if you're the one writing the laws, then you can write them any way you want. And, and you might as well benefit yourself and, the, and, the, and the, the goals you're trying to achieve while you're at it. Uh, so it wasn't long before the policy of recognizing uh, the territories of the nations wasn't really paying off. So they started making the reserves smaller and smaller and smaller as they got along. So as of now today, Canada is a huge, huge country. And even 1% of Canada would be, you know, a big, would be a lot of land, right? One one hundredth of Canada is, is huge. Um, but we didn't get that lucky. Uh, reserve lands in Canada are 0.2%. Uh, so the reserve that I come from, um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty small uh, and, and actually in most original reserves started out bigger, but they slowly got whittled down as time went on. So most reserves have very little land, which means very little resources. Uh, the vast majority of resources in Canada are what we call so-called crown lands, which are owned by the crown uh, which is managed by the government, uh, supposedly in trust for all Canadians. Um, so that means then we basically were, well, at the beginning, we weren't even humans, right? Uh, it took a decision by the Pope 
uh, again, the question was raised as, as the colonizers, explorers landed, are these, do these people have souls? Uh, they recognized we were humans, we were people, uh, but they had to ask the Pope whether we had souls because that made a big difference. Because if we had souls, well then, then the church had a certain level of jurisdiction because there were souls to be saved, uh, to be converted to Christianity. Uh, but if not, well, then we could be treated as animals. Uh, and then even so, even if they're humans, uh, there was still a middle ground where some humans were subject to slavery and others were not. Um, so humans had developed a very nuanced way of classifying other people, depending on what was most expedient at the time. So luckily, it, at least for the most part, we weren't enslaved. Not up here anyways. Uh, other indigenous people in, in other countries and further south often were. Now, of course, our colonization started in 1492, right? That was when Columbus discovered the Americas. <laughs> Uh, and that was, you know, so if you roughly round that off to 1500, that was 500 years ago, right? Barely 500 years ago. Uh, and he landed in down in the Caribbean. But the first explorers here uh, were much later, right? Uh, where I'm from, Lillooet, which is that mountain behind me here on the Fraser River, first explorer was Simon Fraser through there, and that was only 1808. So it's been barely 200 years for us. So, you know, our grandparents, you know, heard the stories from their grandparents who were born in the time before uh, Simon Fraser. So it's not that long for us. So, looking at my notes here. And so probably every aspect of colonization was trauma, right? Whether it was just all the newness, all this, the strange things happening. Um, and then the laws that are imposed uh, and other things included in there like residential schools. Um, relocation, uh, dislocation off your traditional lands and put on reserves, uh, new languages, new laws, all those things. Now, as I say, ours is the most recent, but for each of you, if you look back in your family history and think back as to you know, whether you go back 100, 200, 300, even a thousand years, all the things that have happened in your family line, it's probably not that different, right? It's human history. The history of humans includes a lot of colonization. You know, different parts of Europe colonized other parts of Europe. Um, different parts of Asia colonized other parts of Asia. Uh, and probably in Africa as well, it's, uh, it's human history. Now, at, at some point, I don't know if anyone's going to think of the idea of declaring colonization as a crime against humanity, but I think it ought to be. So if I talk about The history of colonization here, and well, even even say the history of Canada. So Canada is what roughly, I think we turned. How old was did we turn on the last birthday? Must have been one hundred and three. Hey. Well, we had we had or one. What is it? One hundred fifty-two. One hundred fifty-three. 
153. Right. Yeah, that's right. So Canada is 153 years old. Um, and then that's that's kind of arbitrary because that was when they got uh, confederation, right? Uh, but really, you know, North America was colonized long before that. But even if we recognize that Canada itself as a country is 153 years, and so I often ask police recruits who we present to every class coming out of Justice Institute, Police Academy, how will, how long have First Nations people lived here? And some of them know, some of them don't. But, uh, and it's, it's still subject of argument, but I think we can clearly say that 15,000 years is, is indisputable, which is essentially a hundred times longer than Canada has ex existed. Uh, there's, you know, archeological evidence 15,000 years ago that, that we were here. Um, and really the only reason that there isn't older evidence than that is because of the Ice Age. Um, the Ice Age ended roughly 20,000 years ago. So anything that was here before then was buried under a kilometer of ice. And anything that survived that was washed away when the ice melted. Uh, but as soon as that happened, then the evidence of our habitation is still there. And we lived everywhere, right? Um, and we still do, right? From every part of this country, there are reserves because our people live there. Whether it's the coldest, most desolate Arctic coast, or the highest mountains or the hottest deserts or the most lush rainforest, uh, we lived everywhere. Uh, we inhabited every square inch of the continent, and we still do. There isn't, you know, we weren't isolated or restricted to any, uh, just the best areas. We lived everywhere. So, And, th and that, ca that can't be argued either. So for 15,000 years, we were the only ones here and we were responsible for everything and we managed everything. Um, and we had many, many different languages. <clears throat> and each of the people came up from the land, learned about that land and understood that land. And at home, we say all the stories are written in the land. The, our language came from the land. We learned from everything that was there, from the animals, from the mountains, from the rivers. And as I said, every cell of our bodies came from that land. And, and our, we knew our ancestors had been living there for thousands of years. So when we say we are the land, it's literally true because our, all our ancestors had returned to the land and, and, and all these trees grew from the land. And, and, and so that's the connection. It's a spiritual connection that people have with their land. And it's, and it's not just land. As I spoke earlier, it's an ancestor. It's, it's our first grandmother because we knew that she gave everything. She gave every piece of food that we ever ate, every drop of water that we ever drank, every cell of our body, every medicine, every shelter, every, every breath of air that we took came from the land and we would be nothing without her. So really, she's an ancestor, she's a relative. And that we knew we could never really repay her for any of the things that she had given us. And she had given all those things freely. 
without condition, without interruption, without question, without any expectation of repayment. And if you think about it, that's the definition of love, to give without condition, without interruption, without limit, ever. And that's what the land has given all of us. So that's the relationship that Indigenous people have with their land. And somehow along the way, I believe that all people had that relationship with the ori original lands. But as people got displaced and disconnected and moved around and colonized, they started to lose that connection to land and started to, that sense of connection got dulled and, and different lessons got imposed on people. So the thing we rely on when we do our indigenous focusing oriented therapy is, is a connected place. There's a place that we, we believe is, is in here. It's in our solar plexus, it's in your core. And that's your connected place, interconnected place, where you sense those connections to land and each other and, and all things. But unfortunately, colonized thinking has convinced everybody that you only have five senses. And I say, that's crazy to believe that you only have five senses. Um, off the top of your head, you could probably think of three or four or five, right? Whether it's the sense of time, a sense of direction. Uh, you know, uh, uh, intuition, a sense of, uh, but, but everybody has far more senses than five, a sense of balance. Uh, so there's, there's way more senses and that's one of them. And if we can learn, first of all, to accept that there are more and that we can revive them, we can relearn them, we can exercise those muscles and get familiar with them again, then we can all learn that interconnected place, which is the root of the difference between an indigenous worldview and a colonized worldview. Because it's at that point that we recognize that we are connected to everything, everywhere, all the time. And that's just the way the universe is from our perspective. But from a colonized perspective, it starts from a place of, I think, therefore I am, uh, which is Descartes, which is you know one of the foundation principles of modern philosophy, but that separates everybody into individuals. In that way, in that way of thinking, everyone is alone. You're alone in your head. No one can see through your eyes. No one can sense your thoughts. No one can feel your feelings. No one can taste what you taste. But to us, that's crazy. That's, that's like being alone in the universe. And to us, that's, that's the one punishment that we, that we impose on people that's worse than death. That's banishment, that's to be alone. And that's terrifying, and it should be. Who would want to live in a universe alone? But unfortunately, that's the starting point of, of most modern philosophies and, and, and legal traditions, is of, of the individual and not an interconnected individual, but someone who is alone and discreet and separated from everyone and everything. And we never lived that way. 
and it's impossible for us to understand why anyone would do that and how you build any systems based on that. But here we are. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's ready to, if you want to take a break or if you, um, is that, uh, does it seem like a decent time? Uh, yeah, what do you, are you good, Norm? You good to take what, 10, 5, 10? Sure, yep. Yeah. If okay. people want to have a bathroom break. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to meet in the middle at eight minutes because it's 3.02. So okay. let's say 3.10. So do you have family needs to go to the washroom, have a grab a cup of tea, have a stretch, and then come right back and, and let's get right back into this because Norm, it's, it's amazing to listen to. And I think we're all just sitting here kind of like this <laughs> enthralled. And I think we would all just sit and listen. So let's, uh, let's give that, that eight minute break and come back at 3.10. All right, Norm, take yourself off mute, my friend. And when you are ready, back over to you. So I'm going to share my screen and, and I'll go through a little bit of the presentation that I give to, uh, we give to, we share with uh, police recruits and sheriff's recruits. So if indigenous people have been here 15,000 years and that's, you know, really not subject to argument any longer. And Canada's been, so if I draw this line, and I say that's 15,000 years, and this is now, and this is 15,000 years ago. And then just for, to put some markers in here, so that's 5,000 years ago, and that's 10,000 years ago. And then, so we'll put in some other points here. So each of those is a thousand. And so here's probably 150, right? So I draw this on a big whiteboard for the police recruits and say, so really in essence, Canada is 1% of our history. So 99% of our history here in, in British Columbia is pre-Canadian. Um, so now I would suggest that for most <laughs> Canadian history books, if you went to high school here in Canada and you asked people, well, how much of that history book was devoted to the time before Canada? Well, usually it's like, well, there might have been two pages at the beginning of the book that, yeah, I guess there was people here. Uh, and then the explorers arrived. And then, then that's when the book starts. Uh, but our book started way, 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 way before then. Uh, plus our book doesn't have any letters or words. <laughs> our, our books is our stories. So now to put this in perspective, 5,000 years ago here is when the pyramids were built. Right? So they were begun 5,000 years ago. That's when they were, were built. And, that, and there's really not a lot of records of who built the pyramids or how, right? So 10,000 years before the pyramids were built, our people were here, living on their lands, uh, doing what they did, surviving successfully. We were very successful everywhere we lived on these continents. So, that's to put it in perspective for people, right? Now, even if we agree, and, and not everyone agrees, that population 15,000 years ago was pretty low, was near zero. Uh, there's still competing theories about the so-called land bridge across the Bering Strait and, and migration uh, from Asia across the Bering Strait into the Americas, whether it was by land or by sea or whatever. If I draw this line for population, now there's disagreement on how high this population got before contact, right? Some people say, well, actually before I do that, I'm gonna draw in a line of population, human population 
follows essentially a logarithmic scale, right? Like compound interest. So if so, I've done this. I've taken even starting with say six people fifteen thousand years ago, and saying it grew at. I think it. I think I put in ten percent a century, which is a pretty low population growth. But generally, the lines of human population grow like that. That's the way human population growth graphs always go, uh, depending on you know. Uh, room, resources, sickness, uh, various things. But in, in general, with uh, space and with resources and food and land, uh, human population grows on a logarithmic scale. Now, there's very little agreement on, on how the top population, how high it got. The highest population estimates for the Americas which is actually both North and South America, go as high as 100 million. Probably the lowest estimates go as low as 10 million. Uh, and again, this is for all of the Americas. So that would include, you know, what's now Canada, US, Mexico, all the way down to, to Brazil, Chile, Argentina. So I like to, just for argument's sake, try and take a conservative estimate of 35 million and say, just for argument's sake that it got that much, which isn't unreasonable, right? Canada already now is 35 million, right? And Canada is one of the most sparsely populated countries in the world. So even if we agree that it's somewhere in there, we know that something happened in 1492 that caused our population to go like this. Um, and 1492, of course, is when some guy <laughs> uh, named Christopher Columbus landed in the Caribbean and brought something to the Americas, to the so-called New World. And he brought things like, so our population started to drop at 1492 like a drop, like a rock. And there is some speculation that the first disease that hit was a form of coronavirus. Um, no one knows for sure, but it's, it's fairly likely because there are many evolving forms of coronavirus. Uh, the one that's striking now is just the novel, the new coronavirus. Uh, other more devastating uh, Pathogens were smallpox, um, chickenpox, uh, various, various others, measles, mumps, rubella. Uh, I'm not sure of all the names of all these Diphtheria, pertussis, the flu killed us. The common cold killed us. So 1492 would have been the beginning of 400 years of terror, 400 years of death for indigenous people across all of the Americas because these diseases spread like pandemics and they did not wait for explorers. We spread them to each other. We spread them to our families, to our neighbors, to our neighboring communities, and they spread. So if you can imagine being in your community and maybe you've never seen an explorer, all you've seen are some visitors from the neighboring communities, but then one of the children, maybe one of your children, starts to cough or gets a runny nose or gets a spot on their skin. And then they get sick and then they start to die. And there's nothing you can do. None of your medicines work. None of your ceremonies work. None of your practices work and it spreads. 
So as all these global pandemics, a certain percentage of the community would get sick and a certain percentage of the sick would die. And the survivors would try to carry on. And then maybe a few years later, another one would show up. Maybe this time it's chicken pox. And then the same thing would happen. You'd go through, someone would get sick. Someone would, it would spread. Nothing you had worked. And then the survivors tried to carry on, bury the dead and carry on. Some were more devastating than others, but every few years, probably something new would show up and you never knew what it was gonna be. And most of the medicines and the practices that had worked for thousands of years had no effect on this new stuff. This was 400 years of this for indigenous people across the Americas without seeing an explorer because the diseases did not wait for the explorers, we spread them ourselves. So this is undocumented because we had no written language, no pictures, no documentation of it. And the people were so busy just surviving that all oh, there are, are stories. And, and, and again, there are, there are more diseases that I'm not even listing here. So that continued for 400 years until roughly 1900. So if we say 1900 is considered the low point of indigenous populations in the Americas. Now this happened all across in, in North America, Central America, South America, uh, because all were being colonized at the same time. Now in 1900, Canada and the US did a census and counted their Indians. Um, Let's see, I'm gonna try this here. So the US counted 250,000 Indians. Canada counted 100,000 Indians, which means that there were about 350,000 Indians and what's now Canada, the US left in 1900. So let's say that's 1900. So that if say up here was 300 and was 35 million and down here 400 years later was 350,000, that's a survival rate of 1%, which is a death rate of 99%. Now, in doing this research, I thought, oh my God, can you imagine what it would have been like to be one of that 1%, to be one of the survivors of your community who had survived 400 years of death? How do you not just quit? How do you not just say, you know what? I think the creator <laughs> is telling me something. I think it's just time for us to go. But then I started to think about, okay, well, what other qualities would these people have had? Could they have been weak? Could they have been slow? Could they have been less than in any way? And then I, and if you think of them in Darwinian terms, then you realize, and I realize that these people, these 1% were probably the greatest human survivors on the planet at the time. Nobody had survived more death, more disease, more destruction, more loss, more trauma than these survivors in 1900. They were tough, they were fast, they were hard. 
they were probably a bit little mean. And then I also realized that every indigenous person alive today is descended from these survivors. And that's how I started to have a different perspective on the people downtown. They are descended from survivors. They themselves have survived far more than any of us could even imagine. And they're carrying on. And some of them have died several, even many times themselves and been brought back to life by naloxone or Narcan. And they're still, still getting through their days. And man, if that doesn't demand some respect from me, then, <laughs> You know, that gives me a whole different perspective on them and all the other indigenous people alive today. <clears throat> and especially of my mother. You know, she's the reason I, I started doing this research myself to understand how she could have survived what she did and still carry on and be the amazing, wonderful, loving, caring, generous, humorous uh, lady that she is. And then I, I understood that the survivor spirit that exists in the people. And that's who we are. And then after learning some more and, and doing some work and some training with uh, trauma therapy, and that's when I started to also realize that if we can survive it, we can heal it. Because we already survived it. So we might as well heal it. Because <laughs> we can. So then I'll also say that we bounced. We're probably over 3 million now, right? In barely 100 years, we've grown 10 times. And that will also explain some of the other stuff. I started to talk about some of this earlier, um, about some of the statistics and data apply to Indigenous people. Um, you know, when, when I'm delivering this to the police uh, recruits, I say, who in this room has the shortest life expectancy? And I put up my hand. Uh, so we have the shortest life expectancy. Indigenous men, our life expectancy is somewhere between eight and 12 years shorter than everybody else for many reasons. <laughs> Um, and it's not because we're just short-lived, because uh, in fact, our, our ancestors lived a long, long time. They lived to be very, very old ages. Um, so if we look at some of the other uh, social health indicators, um, who has the highest rate of suicide? We do. Who has probably the, the lowest earnings who has the lowest high school graduation rate um, who is most likely to be an alcoholic who's likely to use substances drugs Um, what else is there? Ch children in care. Of all children in care in Canada, so that's children who are apprehended by the government, more than 50% are Indigenous, even though we're only 4% of the population. Um, who's most likely to uh, be charged with a crime? We are. Who's most likely to be convicted of a crime? We are. Who's most likely to go to jail? We are. Who's most likely, who gets the longest sentences? Uh, we do. Of, 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 of men in prison in Canada, uh, Indigenous men are 40% of that population. Of women in prison in Canada, 60% of those women are Indigenous. Um, 
I could go on and on and on here. The, 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 the simple fact is that probably of every negative social health indicator that exists that is measured, the, the data is collected, we lead. Um, you know, it's, it's diabetes, cancers, uh, HIV. Um, I don't think we're leading in COVID though. Oh my God. <laughs> How is that? That one's kind of a miracle. Not haven't, haven't explained it yet. Maybe the other shoe is still gonna drop. We don't know yet. But like I say, every almost every negative social health indicator that exists, we lead. Now here's one other thing that I may have mentioned earlier. Who has the fastest growing population in the country? That's us. How is it? How can we be dying faster of all these things? Dying of all these things faster than everybody else and more frequently than everyone else and also be the fastest growing population in the country. And my answer is this, the 1%, the survivor spirit. We are essentially selected and bred for survival. Uh, then, and and uh, if you read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and if you read uh, the stories of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and you read the things that people have survived, you will know the truth of this, that as, as bad as things are today and now or here, our people have survived far worse. So this is nothing <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> so, so this is our legacy. So one thing I tell young people, indigenous people today, is you are descended from these 1%. They survived, they hung on, they kept going in 1900, in spite of everything, to give us the chance to be here. And they, and through that 1%, bits and pieces of the languages and the cultures and the traditions and the ceremonies and the songs and the dances survived so that we could still have a chance. And and at the moment, it, it appears that the reason that we did that is so that we could share that with everybody else and teach them what it means to live in a responsible way on this planet. Uh, our way of life, and, and I'll talk more about that uh, some today and, and some next time, is about the indigenous worldview, the way we understand what it means to be a good human being, because that was a way that understood balance, that understood the way of things, that, that followed the natural way of, of human responsibility, of, of interconnectedness, um, and of relationship of, with all things that allowed us to live successfully for 15,000 years in these lands without destroying any of it. You know, I used to say that when the explorers arrived, the lands were as good as new. But I got corrected by elders at home and other places and they said, no, the lands were not as good as new. They were better because the people knew it was their responsibility to improve the lands so we know that there's stories of the salmon spawning streams where the people would build a fence in front of the spawning stream that wouldn't let the salmon through to go spawn. Instead, the, the, the people blocked that stream and they would select the largest, the strongest, the healthiest salmon to go spawn. And they were doing that 
for centuries, for millennia, for thousands of years, so that when the first explorers arrived here, they were amazed by the giant trees, by the giant salmon, by the by just the, the vast and, and wealth of the of the riches of the all these lands of, of the vast and, and not here but in the prairies of the buffalo herds, of, of the swarms of carrier pigeons, of you know, the salmon runs of a of a hundred million salmon. And we had done that. We improved the medicine growing areas. We improved the hunting grounds. We improved the the health and the, and the the populations of, of the deer and the moose, uh, uh, of all, because that was our responsibility. And 500 years later, <laughs> I think we're, we're, we're ready to declare the experiment of colonization a failure and say, okay, we tried your way for 500 years. It's going awful. <laughs> And, and we're we're ready and willing to to show you how we did it for fifteen thousand years. Um, so we're pretty sure that that'll work here. Now there are probably indigenous peoples all around the world who could say similar and say, you know what, these colonized ways have not worked that well. They're not equal. They're not balanced. They're not harmonious. They're not peaceful. They're, they're unfair. And, and especially when I look at the screen, you know who most of these colonized ways are most unfair to? Women. I don't know what happened to humanity where in every country, in every language, in every culture, every nationality, every so-called race, every religion, it seems to be the one thing that humanity can agree on is that it's okay for men to mistreat women. I don't know how humanity got to this place, but I'll say that indigenous communities were not based on on anything like that. Uh, this, this, our understanding is for the planning and the decision-making for our communities, in large part, that was done by the old women around the fire. That's where the wisdom and, and the, the, the culture and, and, the, and the decisions for the future were made because they understood the interconnectedness of things and uh, the need to maintain the balance of things. I'm gonna close this now, if that's okay. Um, I, I, I did do a different one. I think I shared with Nagin, um, and then and I shared with Frog Hollow, and, and if anyone's interested, it's kind of just a, a, an actual graph with data, but... Uh, so I'll... I'll talk a little bit about that. And, and <clears throat> so indigenous communities and the worldview that we have is that we're all interconnected and we're connected to all things. And it's not just people, it's to the land too. And it's to the trees and to the rivers and to the mountains. And, and that's a relationship. Um, I don't know if you've heard an indigenous prayer and they tend to end with the term, all my relations all our relations and that doesn't mean me and my family and it doesn't mean me and my cousins and my second cousins it means all my relationships with everyone with everything everywhere every when and that's that interconnectedness that we feel with the universe right so if you when I say great spirit, I, I mean that to mean great spirit, spirit of all things, everywhere, every when. So in that sense, there wasn't really a moment of creation 
for the universe. There was a, an instant of transformation. Indigenous people understand transformation, which science has only, you know, recently caught up on, that there is no creation and destruction in the universe. There's only transformation. You know, science knows now that space and time transform back and forth into each other, that matter and energy transform back and forth into each other. Indigenous people, our stories are full of transformation. So there was no creation. There was an instant when great spirit transformed into the universe. And therefore it's all related, it's all connected. And so are we, we're part of it. <clears throat> and so if we develop that muscle of that sense, of that interconnected sense, then, then we can learn to hear it, to feel it, to sense it again. And that's the source of balance, the source of access to, to true power, the source of access to, to the past, to the future, to all those areas, because it's all connected. And that's how we've also found the most effective means of, of healing intergenerational trauma, trauma of the past, of, the, of our grandparents and our great grandparents, and, and that gets passed down. And it was was a mystery of how how do you how do you heal something that's so long ago or so in the past and it really doesn't feel like it's yours, except unless you go in and go back, and they have the answers and they will help. And then the further back you go, you get to the land, and that's where the true source of all that power and healing and medicine is. And, and, it's, and it's available and accessible to all of us. Um, and so we start, we work with indigenous people, but we also work with non-indigenous people and it doesn't matter, it works. And so that's one of the th recent things that I've learned that have brought me around to this place of, of things making sense and fitting together and finding some understanding and talking with more and more people about it. And them also saying, yes, that fits with what I know and what I see and what I feel and what I believe as well. And it feels right. And, and so the more we can have these conversations, the better. It does mean that we will ask you to re-examine some of the things you believe, some of the things you've been taught, some of the things that we've taken for granted and have become unquestioned. And we're gonna ask some of those questions and ask you to go in and ask yourself, is this right? Is this fair? Is there a better way? And, and maybe among us, we can. And maybe among us, we can find some ideas for some shifts, some change, and find some ways that you know we can help each other, help our communities and help each other's community uh, find a way forward that's, that works, that's based on ancient wisdom, ancestral wisdom, and is respectful to to our first grandmother, the land. So, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> if you wanna, and then we'll, we'll save a few minutes at the end for the um, closing. Um, Thank you, Mark. How, uh, Norm, how long? Where are we? What time? I'm so like, I'm just listening. I'm like, oh my God, I'm facilitating this. I'm supposed to be paying attention. <laughs> it's 345. It, so it, I, I think I'll just open, open, um, you know, just briefly and see if there's any, anything anybody has to, to say or wants to share. The comments in the chat are all, uh, nobody's posted any questions per se. Um, there's just been, been comments and, and, um, 
things that, that you know, people have, have posted in here, principal having to leave um, and that sort of thing. But there's, you know, there's, there's some comments in here around things like white allyship, um comments around um you know how can how can we how can people do how can we do better how can we do better I, i'm not sure if this is the the time to kind of dive into into that um but norm do you have any anything along the the allyship piece that you could maybe share just maybe give, giving people something to kind of mull over particularly you know with our hope that the same group is going to come back in a couple of weeks and come back with us again and carry on this conversation. We'll get to more of that in the next session. Yeah. Uh, and we'll, we'll explore some of that. And, and I, I can share some resource lists and largely now it's hashtags, mm -hmm. <laughs> social yeah. media hashtags on what to follow, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, decolonize. Mm -hmm. If you Google decolonize, uh, go on Instagram, Facebook, decolonize, um, indigenous uh, and then you'll see the other groups and what people are saying and, and they're talking about and then that's a place to start but but i think it needs to go both ways too as much as indigenous people could use the support and help i think that um, newcomers uh, uh, immigrants uh, people all marginalized groups and people and and you know as i shared women you know so many of us have suffered injustice and and how is it that that humanity has come to a place that aren't we supposed to be born free and and to expect justice and to and it should be the natural way of things that that's what each of us should have it shouldn't be the the health and justice and freedom that you can afford it should be the starting point, mm -hmm. um, and especially for women, right? That's you know the most widespread, and I think longest, uh, long-standing injustice that that humans face right now. I, I, and the more I learn about it, just the you know the. the the more outraged we become, right? Like we, we, of course, work with front lines and, and we know the statistics and, and the police and the courts can't refute them. We know that fewer than one in 10 of sexual assaults against women gets reported. And that's a horrible statistic in itself. And fewer than one in 10 of those reports will lead to charges. And that's horrible too and fewer than one in 10 of those charges will lead to convictions. And that's where humanity has arrived. And, and on behalf of all of you and, and my mother and my sister and daughter and granddaughter, this is fixable. This, it should just stop. It's ridiculous, shameful. Um, so there's my, you know, there's, there's a majority right there. <laughs> um, and so again, if we can form alliances amongst all the people who have, have suffered at the hands of colonization and all the things attached to colonization, then surely there's a better way. Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> surely, surely. Um, um, how about, how about, I, I have a, a suggestion for the rest because we're, we, I don't think we have any time to get into any more topics. So let's park these thoughts and, and ideas. Um, I think, and Norm and I have talked about this in, in the few conversations that we've had leading up to this event, but I think one of the um, life-changing things that I learned was from Elder Roberta Price um, at a symposium that we did um, in April 2019, where she talked about the role of the matriarch um, and the role of women and how that was completely turned upside down and what has happened 
to indigenous communities with the, the, the gender role completely inverted. And then the complete fallout from that that spilled out into, into like you say, anybody who's been impacted by colonization. And so I'm really looking forward to getting into some of those relational pieces with you um, as we move on. So I'm going to do the businessy part really quick. I'm going to blast through it, and then we'll go back to Norm, and Norm's going to help us um, end today in a good way and, and bring us all kind of um, back back to a good place. So here I go. Let me just get this businessy part out of the way. Okay, we did that bit. We did that bit. Okay, so this is the next bit. So we will be sending out an evaluation form. Um, it's really important that we get feedback from you. It's it's great for us to be able to share that with Norm. Um, and also as we start to uh, look at other, um, other ways to engage in this work, uh, we need to hear from you. So that will be arriving shortly. Uh, again, we'd like to thank IRCC for funding the, uh, this event today and for funding our event again next week. Now I thought those dates were in here somewhere. There, yeah, I skipped over it. Um, so November 9th, 2020, same time, two o'clock, four o'clock. Um, the link was posted in the chat. The link was also when you registered for this one, this, the second link was just below it in the email. Um, so we really do encourage you to, to participate again. And so uh, on behalf of all of us, Norm, thank you so much for, for sharing and for being so, um, so open with your story. I think it's something that um, we don't, we don't get enough of in the work that we do. Do we don't, we don't, just tell stories enough and, and open up share. And I think um, you you made it so real for us just in sharing your story. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna hand it back to you um, to finish us off in a good way. Okay then, well, thank you all for your time, your attention. I want to talk with all of you, but <laughs> I can't. Um, okay, settle into your body. Notice yourself. We're going to find a good place. Notice your feet. Notice your hands. Notice your breath. Think of a place of water. piece of water that you know. Yeah, this water knows you. Could be a seaside, a river, a drop. Let your body be there. How is your body with that water? Notice the time of year, time of day. Notice who else or what else knows this water. Think of how long this water has been. Think of all the things that this water has seen and knows. You can sense it, feel the touch of this water. Let your body remember that it is water as well. Let 
your body remember that its water is related to this water. This water is another ancient ancestor of yours. This water knows you, supports you, loves you. Let your body accept that connection. Know that that connection is always there. Be grateful for the water. Give thanks in your way. Say thank you to the water and tell the water you'll be back when you need it. Prepare to say goodbye to that water. Till next time. Prepare to leave that place and come back here. Come back into the room, into your body. Notice your breath, your feet, your hands, your face. Ah, I'll know you're back when I see your eyes open. Maybe your head move. <laughs> I hope you're all in a good place. Found some good water. Some good water spirit. Good water medicine. And if you have thoughts, write, jot them down and bring them back next time. Maybe share them with Katie or Nagin, and we can talk about them next time. And the ultimate goal is that we find some space after this, beyond this, to continue these conversations uh, so that, again, we can learn together and uh, grow together. Uh, we say takam nshneknukwa, which means all my relations. Oh. <laughs> that went pretty quick. <laughs> Thank you, Norm. Have a lovely, wonderful day. Thank you to everybody, and we'll see you again in two weeks.